In the garage of Dr. Frank Conrad, on November 2nd, 1920, the first scheduled pre-advertised radio program in the United States went on the air. Station KDKA was broadcasting returns of the presidential race on the evening of Election Day. From a humble beginning in a Pittsburgh garage to the sumptuous studios of the national radio networks in New York, Chicago, and Hollywood, these years have come to be known as the golden era of radio. Coco Malls presents the Park Avenue Penners, starring the black sheep of the family, Joe Penner, with Gene Austin and the music of Jimmy Griff. When my baby smiles at me, what a familiar, tuneful radio signature. And need I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that this melody heralds the approach to the microphone of that lovable, hi-hatted tragedian of song, Ted Lewis. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Bill Stern bringing you the 381st edition of the Colgate Shave Cream Sports Newsreel, featuring strange and fantastic Columbia stories. Tonight, WTIC Radio presents the third program in a series that will explore this golden era. Good evening. This is Dick Bertel, and with me once again to explore this golden era is the man with 2,000 hours of radio memories on tape, Mr. Ed Corcoran. Ed, it's a pleasure to do this show again with you, and what memories are you going to share with us tonight? Well, we have a number of shows tonight, Dick, but the most notable is Fred Allen, Mr. District Attorney, and for very special reasons, gangbusters. Yes, and those special reasons are because of our guest, Jack Bishop, now manager of agency sales training at the Aetna Life and Casualty here in Hartford, and formerly research writer for gangbusters, among other shows. And Jack, it's a pleasure to have you with us tonight. Thank you, Dick. Good to be here. We're going to have some fun because we're going to reminisce together about some of those great ideas and those shows that brought back so many memories to us when we first heard them tonight as our show opened. And Jack, you were saying before we went on the air that uh, people today are really missing out on something when they don't hear radio as we knew it. What, what, What specifically do you mean by that? Well, radio, of course, was audio only. And it required each individual to come up with his own personal uh, internal video image. And that image was just as graphic as he wanted to make it. For that reason, it involved people to a degree that television cannot. And, of course, we've lost people today in this field. We've lost, for example, the sound effects man. Yes, this is one of the vanishing uh, Americans. I think you indicated, as far as you know, there's only one really active in the uh, television business now. But the television or the radio uh, sound effects man was uh, a magician. He really could do some amazing things, and he was very accomplished. And yet, uh, even though people knew that these effects were being artificially produced, they liked it that way. That's right. That's right. We were willing to be fooled. We knew it, and we went right along with it. And one of the people who fooled us every Sunday night for so many years was a gentleman by the name of Fred Allen. How many memories that brings back, Ed? Yes, we have a real good uh, Fred Allen excerpt tonight. This is uh, the Allen's Alley segment where uh, he interviews uh, Ajax Cassidy and people of that nature. And uh, there are some sound effects here to emphasize the point just made, but I think if people who remember Fred Allen always remember Allen's Alley as being the highlight of the show. That was their favorite section of the show that he did. Jack, shall we stroll down Allen's Alley once again? Let's do that. Yeah. Any minute we'll be leaving now for Allen's Alley. Oh, what is your question tonight? Well, one of the greatest problems facing the country today, of course, is housing. Here in New York City, thousands of people are looking for places to live. And so our question is, how is the housing shortage affecting you? Shall we go? As one B-29 said to the other, let's take off. (laughs) Ah, Portland, it sure is good to be back down here in Allen's Alley. I wonder if the same people still live here. Well, there's only one way to find out. I'll knock at this first door again. Somebody, I say, somebody knocked. <laughs> uh, who was it? Uh, pardon me, mister. Senator Claghorn's the name. Claghorn, that is. Senator Claghorn? Uh, I'm from the south, uh, the deep south. 
from way down south. Eh? Uh, yeah, I'm so far down south that my family is treading water in the Gulf Stream. <laughs> That is South, isn't it? Yeah, where I live, we call the people from Alabama Yankees. <laughs> well, I don't uh, know. Don't butt in when the body's talking, son. Try listening. <laughs> now, see, try listening. You're bound to learn something. Well, look, Senator. Anything I'll... gets me down, it's two people trying to talk at the same time. Well, I know. But... I got the floor, son. Don't try no filibuster. <laughs> Now, look, Senator, what about the housing shortage down there in Washington? I stop at a hotel. Oh, you actually have a room? What room? You mean, uh... For $20 a day, they give me a chair in the lobby and a sleeping pill. <laughs> pill, that is. <laughs> what is the housing problem coming to, Senator? Uh, there's only... I say there's only one solution. And that is? Close up the OPA. Well, what will happen if we close the OPA? There'll be millions of ceilings left over. Yes. You put four walls under them ceilings, you got houses. <laughs> so long, son. So long, that is. <laughs> You know, I think the senator's got something there. Got something there. <laughs> I, uh, I wonder what a knock at this next door will bring. Howdy, bub. Oh. <laughs> You're, uh... Titus Moody's my name. Titus Moody? Moody by name, Moody by nature. Well... <laughs> Tell me, Mr. Moody, has the housing shortage bothered you any? Yeah, that's why I had to leave the farm, bub. Really? Yeah. The land was so poor, you'd have to use 20 sacks of fertilizer to raise a tune on it. <laughs> Gosh. Cows were so weak, they used to travel in pairs. The cows had to travel in pairs? Yeah. Took two cows to pull up a blade of grass. <laughs> the uh, land was dry, was it? Dry. I didn't see no water for 20 years. 20 years? One day it rained. Yes? When the first drop of water hit me, I fainted. Yes? Yeah, they had to throw two buckets of dust in my face to bring me to. <laughs> Gosh, uh, how, did you, uh, how did you cope with the housing problem, Titus? Why, well, I, I ordered one of them two-room houses from Sears Roebuck. But it didn't help. You mean when Sears Roebuck delivered the two rooms? Sears, two room was, house? Sears was living in the front room and Roebuck was living in the back. Go <laughs> on, Buck. Well, if I... <laughs> <laughs> if farmers can't find houses, I guess traveling salesmen will just have to keep on traveling. And that brings us to another door. No. Oh, Mrs. Nussbaum. Expecting maybe Emperor Shapiro Hito? <laughs> tell me. <laughs> tell me, Mrs. Nussbaum, how do you. How do you feel about the housing shortage? Thanks to the housing shortage, today Pans and Nussbaum is enjoying connubial bliss, if you. <laughs> Pardon the expression. Yes. About... <laughs> well, what happened? What happened, Mrs. Ann? It's flocking to my house relatives. Relatives? Blood relatives. Relatives without blood. <laughs> Say, you must have a full house. Full. And the couch is sleeping two Rappaports, cousins. Uh-huh. <laughs> And the dining room table is sleeping four Weinsteins. All four of them on one table? They are half-brothers. It is making only two. Oh, well. <laughs> I see. In the bathtub is sleeping Ben Schwartz, an uncle. Mm-hmm. And top Uncle Ben is the little Pinker's boy. <laughs> he is floating on the water. Oh. <laughs> the Pinker's uh, boy is a good swimmer? A human stager. Oh, really? <laughs> Well, tell me, Mrs. Nussbaum, with all your relatives jamming the house, didn't your husband get mad? Mad? One morning, Pierre is putting on his beret. <laughs> he is taking his...
his Molly Pecan records. Took his Pecan records with him, huh? And he is stamping out. Your husband left you? For two weeks, I am a widow. Well, what happened? One night, is coming on the door and knocking. Pitter pat, pitter pat. Pitter pat. <laughs> Your husband? Mine, Pierre is back. Oh, it was true love. Pierre couldn't live without you. Love, small Pierre couldn't find that room. <laughs> Well, here we are near the end of the alley. I wonder who lives here. Hello, hello. We're here to say hello. Not how we do, not Polly Boo, but just hello. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, look. <laughs> but just a minute, who are you boys? We're the Gee and the Gee. We're songwriters. What songs have you written? Have you heard? We're looking for the guy that began the beginning to see if we can get him to stop it. <laughs> no. Have you heard? When my baby smiles at me, I wish she'd put in her teeth. <laughs> Please. Oh, Tonight, it so happens, we're discussing the housing shortage. We just wrote a housing shortage song. A housing song? How does it go? Hit it, Sam. The situation's serious. It may get worse by spring. We mean the housing shortage, and that is why we sing. East side, west side, all around. Hotels and apartments are crowded everywhere you walk. If it gets any worse, we'll all be sleeping on the sidewalks of New York. You know... His humor, Fred's humor, and the theme of that show is just as appropriate today as it was back in 1947 <laughs> when that show went on the air. Certainly. Now, who were some of the characters who appeared with Fred? Well, Ajax wasn't in. Uh, I guess he must have moved between the time we started. <laughs> but um, there was this open show, wasn't it? What's the first name you remember that one? Falstaff open show. Yes. Mm. He was the, uh, that last spot was revolved between uh, the people we just heard, the McGee and McGee, Openshore, and then um, Ajax, Ajax Cassidy, Cassidy. Cassidy. <laughs> and they had a rotating basis there. Who were the others? Well, it was Parker Fenley, uh, played Titus Moody, uh, Minerva Pius, played uh, Mrs. Uh, Nussbaum, and, of course, uh, Kenny Delmar did Senator Claghorn. Well, Jack, let's get to your career now, which began in 1937, as far as uh, a radio continuity writer is concerned. You were a police reporter in New York. How did you manage to become involved with radio? Well, I was introduced to uh, Commissioner Lewis Valentine, and Phillips Lord was at the time trying to find a way to build a program. He had an idea that the lives and exploits of flesh and blood criminals would be a dramatic series, or could be. So he asked Lewis Valentine to recommend someone. And through my connections with Valentine at the police department, uh, I was recommended to be the writer for this material. And I said about, uh, as I recall, it was a good long time ago, but the, uh, the first shows were built for the uh, auditioning with the sponsors uh, from newspaper files of cases that had been long closed. Where did you find these papers? Well, in the... Uh, what they call the morgue in the newspaper office, the files, the mm -hmm. bound files. And then once the show was accepted and, and the sponsor had agreed uh, to carry it, then we continued that process. And every day I read newspapers from all over the country looking for crime news and building a file on what looked like a promising situation. Perhaps it might be a a jailbreak in Oklahoma from which half a dozen uh, hardened criminals had escaped. And I would follow them around the country as they were picked up and reported in the newspapers and then finally brought to trial. And then assembling all of this and contacting, mostly by correspondence, the uh, police officers, state police, uh, FBI, treasury agents, and others who were involved in these cases, uh, built a narrative, supplied the... Uh, dialogue that was appropriate to the action. And from that story, then, that narrative, the script was written. I was amazed, Ed, to learn how many newspapers a day Jack would read 
<laughs> yeah, how many did you go through anyway <laughs> to get well, all this information? I had a standing order down at the uh, out-of-town newspaper stand at 42nd Street in New York. I'm not even sure that's still in the same location. <laughs> but I went through 85 newspapers every night 85. to my wife's dismay. But quickly, looking for crime news. I didn't stop to read society notes or comics, but look, just looked for crime news and kept files on those uh, situations that looked as if they might have dramatic possibilities. Well, uh, unlike today, uh, you didn't change any names, did you? You used the actual names of the characters, and they were done that way on the air. They were done that way on the air, and so far as I know, there was never any uh, legal contest over invasion of privacy or anything of the other. We simply uh, waited until these people were jailed, <laughs> as Dragnet does today, and uh, reported their exploits. Did you ever talk to any of the criminals themselves? Oh, a great deal of the time, uh, especially in the metropolitan area around New York, uh, New Jersey, um, Jersey City, and visited them in jails and uh, penitentiaries, very gloomy places. You made a comment, Jack, which kind of uh, <laughs> frightens me even to think about it today. You said that for three or four years, after you, you got off the show, you were afraid to sit in a restaurant with your back toward the door. <laughs> yeah, like Bill Hitch Hillcock, I guess. Bill Hitchcock. You know. it, it sounds a little affected, but actually it was, it was true. These people were, by nature, very uh, careful about the way they protected themselves. And this sort of uh, apprehension is contagious. I suppose, especially when you're dealing with this criminal element. Yeah, there was one criminal you actually met, wasn't it? The Mad Dog Cole, was it, that you had some experience with him? Well, I didn't meet him, fortunately. I saw from across the street as he was being uh, forced out of a building he had holed up in with a huge supply of guns and ammunition. Just like they did on the movie uh, Scarface, something like that? Yes, very much the same. As a matter of fact... That sort of thing was done more than once. I don't recall some of the other names, but the all of the the panoply of uh, drama was there with uh, searchlights and fire trucks and uh, police cars with sirens wailing and lights flashing and riot guns and everything you can imagine, tear gas included. And these things were were living drama. Jack, you were you were the the. Uh the continuity writer, you you got the facts, you put in the dialogue. Now, did another writer come along and actually write the script? Yes. The, uh, the Phillips Lord organization had a group of script writers. Uh, I don't remember. I'm sure I must have met them back in those days, but I couldn't tell you who they were. But they took the narrative and scripted it to the length with the necessary spots for uh, commercials and the like. But... Uh, the narratives themselves were my contribution to the effort and the clues at the end, which... Uh, this is another part yeah. of the story, <laughs> because right. actually, Jack, you never heard any of these broadcasts. Jack was... Well, I'm giving it away here. Jack was, <laughs> was standing by, and we'll tell you why, after you hear tonight's Gangbusters excerpt. This is going to be one of the firsts for you, Jack, because you're going to be able to listen to the show without having to Good. sit by the phone. And now... In cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States, Gangbusters! Once for 52-year-old man with heavy eyebrows and broad nose, Hobbies are wrestling and portrait painting. More to follow on Gangbusters Clues. Gangbusters, the only national program that brings you authentic police case histories, has asked John J. Sullivan, former deputy commissioner and chief of detectives, police department, city of New York, to narrate by proxy tonight's case. Commissioner Sullivan. Thank you and good evening, Gangbusters listeners. Years of experience have taught police officers one useful factor about criminals. When more than one person is involved in a given crime, the chances of solving that crime increases. Tonight's case involves more than one criminal. It began at 11.40 p.m. the evening of June 15, 1953. 
Two men had just left a waterfront bar on New York's West Street and were walking through a deserted side street. I am still worried about it, soldier. I think you make a big mistake. Now look, it's over six months now. Everybody has forgotten, including the cops, so you'll forget it. Huh? It is not so. Look, now, did the soldier ever steer you wrong? Did I? No. Well, and you listen to me, you stop worrying, huh? Okay? Well, here it is. What do you think, huh? Latest model with all the extras, including tubeless tires. <laughs> Nothing too good for the soldier, huh? Uh, what do you think? A car like that costs a lot of money, soldier. I thought we were going to wait a year before we spend any of it. Ah, six months is long enough. You worry too much. Come on, I'll, I'll give you a lift home. No, I walk. What's the matter? Are you even too worried to ride it? One is a nice night. I walk. <laughs> okay, kid. You'll be around at the gym tomorrow, huh? Oh, sure, soldier. I'll be there. I really got it this time. This time I'm going to make it right back up to the top. Sure, soldier. <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow. Carlos La Jolla continued on foot down the block. The district through which he walked consisted of small stores, junk shops, and some boarded-up, dilapidated tenements. They were closed and the street empty, except for a black sedan that came slowly towards him and stopped by the curb. You honking for me, mister? You want me? Help! Help! Help me! Somebody! Please! Help me! A shooting with no witnesses. A start from scratch. A local sector car on routine patrol discovered the wounded man on the sidewalk. An ambulance was called. Detectives Fred Bryan and Harry Gomez of the homicide detail took over from there. They went first to the hospital to talk to the injured man. La Jolla. La Jolla. Madre. Mi madre. He's calling for his mother. Yeah. Carlos, we're trying to locate your mother now. Uh, Carlos, do you know who did this to you? No. Can you tell us anything that would help? Uh, only... Only one thing. The, the soldier... A friend. Carlos, what's his name? His full name? Soldier, tell him, tell him before it, before it is too late. Go on, Carlos. Now try to finish. Better tell the doctor to come in, Harry, and the priest too. Later, Gomez joined Brian in the ballistics lab, where tests were being made on the slugs taken from La Jolla's body. Uh, here's the card on La Jolla. Yeah, what does it show, Harry? Two arrests for petty larceny, one conviction. He was 18 then. Mm. Was given a suspended sentence and put into the custody of his mother. Father? Deserted the mother in 1934. Mrs. La Jolla brought her son to New York in 1935. Mm. Hey, Brian Gomez. What'd you find, yeah. Gordon? Something really surprising. Oh, like what? Come over here to the table, see for yourself in the microscope. Yeah. Go on, have a look. Slug on the left is the one taken from La Jolla's lung. Uh-huh. As you can see, it matches the slug on the right perfectly. Well, that should prove that both shots fired into La Jolla were from the same gun. Well, we proved that right away. That slug on the right wasn't taken from La Jolla's body. What do you mean? I mean that slug on the right has been on file here for a long time. Huh? It was taken from the body of the night watchman who was killed in the Cuffley tooling plant payroll robbery last November. What do you make of that? A bullet was the only connection between the murder of Carlos La Jolla, a murder seemingly without a motive as yet, and the $43,000 tool company robbery. 
The office of the Cutley plant was on the ground floor and separated from the factory portion by some grimy, thin partitions. Sorry to keep you waiting. Yeah, it's all right. I'll sit down. Thank you. I want to rush you, Lieutenant, but I'm very busy today. Every time I get settled down to work, another cop comes in here, starts asking questions, disturbing our routine, upsetting my employees. Uh, you fellows have had six months. You haven't come up with a thing. For six months you've been bothering us. Now, why don't you leave us alone? I don't get it unless you have something new, Brian. Uh, we have something new. Oh? Well, why didn't you say so? You see, a man was murdered last night just off West Street, not far from here, as a matter of fact. I don't see what that has to do with our payroll robbery. Well, you don't have to. That's our job. Now, here. Have a look at this photo, will you? You recognize this man? No, I never saw him before. What's he done? He got himself killed. Named Carlos La Jolla. That name mean anything to you? Not a thing. Hmm. He had a record, two arrests for petty larceny. It's a long jump to a $43,000 payroll robbery. Maybe so, maybe not. We're going to find out. We're going to need your help. I just don't get it. A man is found dead. I'm murdered. And just because it's near here, you think there's a connection. Now, look, Mr. Cuffley, are you going to help us? What can I do? Well, I'd like to show this photo to all your employees, see whether any of them know La Jolla. Now, how about it? All right, I'll get our foreman on it right away. I'm sorry, Brian, if I got worked up. You know, oh, it's, it's, oh, excuse me. Certainly. Yes? This is Detective Gomez. Is Brian still there? Oh, yes, just a moment. It's for you, Brian. Detective Gomez? Oh, thanks. Yeah, Harry? I got a description of Carlos' friend from Mrs. La Jolla and sent out an alert. We got a quick return. Phillips just radioed in. He's located our boy. Oh, which one? The soldier. His name is Wally Revlock. Fights under the name of so uh, Soldier Revlock. Yeah, where'd they locate him? At the Diamond Gym, a training place for fighters. Better let Phillips bring him in for questioning, Hank. Hey? No, no, I got a better plan. Uh, keep an eye on him, and I'll meet you there in ten minutes. I know the place. We'll do our questioning there, okay? Okay. Um, you having any luck where you are? Yeah, I don't know yet. That soldier Revlock, that little guy punching the bag over the corner. Oh. Oh. Hey, Revlock! my day's trainer. Yeah. Got to be ready when the call comes, you know. Got to have the hands hard and in good shape. Mm. Hands, mister, it's all in the hands. That's the old bread and butter. <laughs> now, hand me that towel, will you please? Yes. Yeah, I thank you. So what is it you... What do you want to talk to me about, mister? Fight, huh? Knows my style, huh? It is. It's about a fight, isn't it? It's about a killing. Chilling. Yeah, we're police officers. Now, did you know our Carlos La Jolla? Carlos La Jolla? Yeah, I know him. Why are you ask? He's dead. Yeah, I know. Carlos was a great kid. Best. Used to work out with me when I couldn't afford a sparring partner. I'd like to get my hands on the one who did it. He was a good boy, Carlos. But you can't afford a sparring partner now. Well, I, I got my hands on some money. How? An old friend lent it to me. What's your friend's name? His name... His name is Jerry Boone. Suppose we check with Boone. Well, you can't. Uh, Jerry died three months ago. You, you, you can check on that, though, if you don't believe me. Why shouldn't we believe you? Well, asking so many questions like, yeah, acting like maybe I, I did something wrong. Have you? There was no doubt in the minds of detectives Brian and Gomez, gangbusters listeners, that Soldier Revlock knew more than he was telling they decided to play a waiting game and keep the soldier under surveillance. Sometimes this pays off. A few hours later, Brian was sitting at his desk catching up on a sandwich and a cup of coffee. Drop the sandwich, Fred. What? Phillips just called in on Revlock. Someone shot him in his rooming house. Well, I thought Phillips had that all staked down. No, so did I. Says he went for a glass of water, took only a minute, heard a shot, and rushed back. Nobody but Revlock lying on the floor, plugged in the stomach. No. Phillips thinks the guy went up the stairs and over the roof. How's Revlock? Not good. Back to gangbusters in a moment. Tomorrow night on CBS Radio's Amos and Andy show, Kingfish's ever-loving wife, Sapphire, gets tired of waiting for Kingfish to get a job and takes one herself. 
Swelling with pride over his wife's sudden affluence, Kingfish does his part. Buys her a wardrobe consistent with her new position. What happens next, we'll hold back until tomorrow night. Don't miss the fun on the Amos and Andy Show on most of these same stations every Sunday night. And now, back to Gangbusters. Come in, gentlemen. Close the door. Yeah, this is Detective Gomez, my partner. Oh, glad to meet you. <coughs> How do you do? Thank you. I had my foreman check the entire plant personnel on the photograph that you left with me. No one here recognized that man, uh, what's his name, La Jolla? Yeah, La Jolla, Carlos La Jolla. Nobody, huh? I wish I could be more helpful. Now, look, Cuffley, here it is. A man named Roy shot your night watchman six months ago at the time of the payroll robbery. I wouldn't know. And this Roy probably shot Carlos La Jolla. I told you, I don't know this La Jolla. That's what you told us. Why do you ask me all this? I don't know anything. And this Roy took a shot at a fighter named Soldier Revlock just an hour ago. Why tell me all this? Because Soldier Revlock told us that he, La Jolla, and Roy were all hired by you to hold up your own payroll, Cuffley. Now, come clean. This soldier told you that? He did, just an hour ago. Now, Cuffley, you are into this thing up to your neck. You might as well come clean. How about it? How about it, Cuffley? All right. I planned the robbery. My wife kept asking me for money. I didn't know the... the watchman would be killed. Uh Uh-huh. And after the job was pulled, you were afraid of the soldier in La Jolla. Afraid they'd talk, especially the soldier after we'd been to see him. That's why you had this Roy kill him, wasn't it? Roy killed the soldier? But you said he spoke to you. Before he died, Cuffley. Then you haven't got a witness. The soldier is dead. We haven't got Roy either, Cuffley. But we've got you for a starter. Now, come on. Cuffley revealed to the police that Roy's last name was Packham. Packham was apprehended within 48 hours and confessed to the dual murders. He was sentenced to execution in the electric chair. Henry Cuffley was also electrocuted for his complicity in the murders. Thank you, John J. Sullivan, former deputy commissioner and chief of detectives, police department, city of New York. Tonight's Gangbusters case was written by Edward J. Adamson and directed by Leonard L. Bass with Louis Van Ruten, Scott Tennyson, and Will F. Zuckert in leading roles. This production was supervised for CBS Radio by Jerry Danzig. Gaylord Avery speaking. of the Mutt and Jeff team on Gangbusters, a production of CBS Radio in cooperation with Phillips H. Lord. Stay tuned now for Gunsmoke, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. You know, they talk about violence on television today, Jack, and you certainly had your share of it back then, didn't you? <laughs> and nobody seemed to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to remind our listeners that they're tuned to WTIC in Hartford, Connecticut. You're listening to the Golden Age of Radio, and our special guest is Jack Bishop, formerly research writer for Gangbusters, and another show that was very familiar to you back in that era, We the People. And, of course, the co-host of this program is Ed Corcoran. Ed... Can you identify some of the other actors on that particular show? Yes, I don't feel I'm doing my job, Dick, unless I can. Um, Ralph Bell uh, played the uh, part of the, uh, in the early part of the sketch. Uh, he was, the, I believe, the man that was killed. Mandel Kramer and Louis Van Ruten was the detective, and they already announced Bill Zuckert and Wendell Holmes. So for the radio buffs, uh, all the cast members are now identified. <laughs> Well, you know, I said before we played that excerpt, Jack, that you never did hear the program when it was on the air, and for a very good reason. Now, what was the reason? Well, if I heard it, I heard only a piece of it with one ear, because my assignment when the show was on the air was to sit with an open telephone line to the CBS studio to substitute another clue in the event that one of the people we were about to broadcast as a wanted person were to be caught. 
And this happened on several occasions. And you can believe that it increased the tension quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Well, that element of the show we haven't heard as yet, so suppose we do that now. And now, Gangbusters Nationwide Clues. Broadcast every week to assist American police in their war against the underworld. Attention, Gangbusters listeners. Aaron Harry Gordon is wanted by the FBI for unlawful flight to avoid confinement for the crime of murder. Listen carefully to his official description. Aaron Harry Gordon, age 52, 5 feet 5 and 1 half inches, 145 pounds, short build, dark chestnut hair, blue green eyes, fair complexion, may seek work as a house painter. This fugitive is blind in left eye, has heavy eyebrows, and nose is broad at ridge. He is an amateur wrestler, a proficient still life painter, and portrait painter. Caution. Gordon may be armed and should be considered dangerous. If you have any information concerning this clue, notify your local police, the nearest office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or gangbusters at once. Jack, how effective were these clues in apprehending criminals? Well, I can't recall the numbers, but I know that there were criminals caught this way. Uh, this was one index, I suppose, to the uh, listening audience that gangbusters attracted and held for quite a period of years. Of course, audiences were very faithful during those years. These were the Depression years, weren't they? Yes, yes. The Depression was still very much with us, and people simply didn't have money to go to movies or to travel to the extent they do today. As a matter of fact, uh, in retrospect, the, the family radio was the, the family center for the evening's activities for the most part. People didn't walk around with transistor radios glued to their ears as they walked the streets. It didn't work that way. Well, another show that you were associated with was We the People. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, I know that was a very popular show uh, uh, during its era on the air. It was an interesting show in that... Uh, it brought together unusual people who had had unusual things happen to them or who could do unusual things. And they were uh, brought, in the early days of the show at least, uh, physically from their homes to the studio to tell about their exploits or their situations, whatever they might have been. And the uh, initial show, though, I remember best because it was written from a um, bound newspaper files in the basement of the New York Public Library. <laughs> and, <laughs> that's where you spent your time. <laughs> that's where I spent my time finding unusual people <laughs> in the newspaper files. And then, of course, they picked some unusual ones, too. And I think it was General Mills, I'm not certain, uh, the initial sponsor of that show. And they uh, bought the show based on that first program written that way. This, uh, now, 30 years later, can be told, Jack, I think, uh, the program was hoped, wasn't it? <laughs> well, to the extent that many of these people were, as you may have heard if you listen very carefully on Gangbusters, where a prominent law enforcement official narrated by proxy, mm -hmm. and that by proxy got <laughs> off very fast, uh, most of these people, as the show went on, uh, were uh, uh, simulated, their, their parts were taken by actors. I suppose, too, that little fillers from the backs of newspapers were embellished and uh, built into real radio dramas, <laughs> weren't they? <laughs> well, in retrospect, uh, I suppose they were. I remember only few of them. Uh, one I mentioned to you earlier this evening about the man, I think it was in Detroit, that woke up and found an 18-foot python in his bed. Uh, he obviously qualified as having an unusual experience. Uh, <laughs> yes, I you, would say so. You didn't have to hire an actor to <laughs> dramatize that. But some of the other things were simulated, certainly. Mm. But the people, uh, as was the case with sound effects, they knew it was happening, but they enjoyed the result. It's like watching a musician, and you know he's fooling you, but you like that. Well, of it's course... A, yeah, it's a rare show. As a matter of fact, I don't even have a recording. If anybody has one, we'd play it sometime on the air. We'd like to hear what it sounds like. But that would bring back a lot of memories, a lot of uh, different narrators. Gabriel Heater, I believe, was the first he narrator. He was the first one, yes. 
Milo Bolton, do you remember that name by any chance? Oh, I'm afraid eh? not. Before no, my time. It was before <laughs> your time. Well, here's a show that was not before your time, I'm sure. Mr. District Attorney. And this one was your baby, Jack. It was. This was your idea. Yes, in a, in a rather unique and informal way. And this started on a non-commercial radio station for fun by myself and, and two other men who were then uh, students at City College in New York. As a matter of fact, they're well known in the business today, at least they are to me. Ted Cott, who uh, went on to managerial positions right. with the network, and the other was... Tony Marvin. Yes. Mm. So Tony <laughs> was the announcer primarily and, and did some acting in it too. But we did this, we met, oh, I think it was in Greenwich Village, if I'm not mistaken. But we uh, did this for kicks. And there were some actors from City College of New York. They had a little theater group. And this went on for perhaps 10 or 12 weeks. And it was called The White Legion. Now, where I got that poetic title, I have no idea. But in any case, it, uh, it was picked up because we, let's say, got uh, disenchanted with doing it. So we simply walked away and left it. And you uh, had the names of, of Harrington and, uh, and Miss Miller as part of your cast? They were you? all part of the original cast, and uh, Phillips Lord picked it up, and District Attorney was the result. And there was one opening line. I will never forget it. I don't think <laughs> any radio buff ever will. You wrote this, and by golly, before we hear the actual broadcast, I want to hear Jack Bishop read it. <laughs> you are on. <laughs> and it shall be my duty as district attorney, not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. Those are your uh, words. Yes. <laughs> That's immortal, really. That's like the Ohio silver and some of these, or the word gangbusters itself. You really have brought a lot of words into the language, Jack. All right, let's listen now to Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> shall be my duty as district attorney, not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. Mr. District Attorney is brought to you in the public interest as part of the constant fight for a better America by Bristol Myers, the makers of Sal Hepatica for the smile of health and Vitalis for well-groomed hair. Sal Hepatica, Vitalis. And tonight, the case of the money machine. Who is it? Let me in, Joyce. I got him with me. Is... Is he all right? He won't... He won't get violent or anything. Well, of course he's all right. Uh, sit down, Frank. Take off your coat. Can he understand, Emil? Take off your coat. You hear me, Frank? I understand. I was worried sick. I still am. Worried? And you just sit there, Frank. You don't have to talk. Oh. Did it go all right? Yeah, yeah, there was nothing to it. I slipped in the back door of the asylum, got him out of his room, and here we are. Didn't take an hour. You sure they won't miss him before morning. Oh, look, Joyce, I told you I used to work in the joint three years ago. I took care of cases like him. Oh, I know, but won't he's, he's just like a lump of, of putty or something. You set him down and he stays there. Well, he doesn't look crazy, I'll say that for him. No, he, he lives in a state, something like that. I got a lot of them like him. Always seem to be, seem to be thinking about something a million miles away. Frank? Frank, now leave him alone. He's all right. Give him a pan of water after a while. We'll keep him in the back room until we hook up with the carny. A pan of water? Like a dog? I don't want him cutting himself on any glass, kid. He's a little money machine. I still wonder if it'll work. No carnival wants a guy working. You ought to be in a hatchery. Well, who's going to know? He'd be a sensation, I tell you. We used to turn him on all the time when I worked the hospital. Turn him on? Yeah, sure. The, the doc explained it one day. He's got a mind for figures, see? 
That's why I thought we'd build the act as the lightning calculator. You like it? Ask him something, Emil. You know, just like you were a square in the crop. Oh, sure. He likes it. Uh, all right, Frankie. Uh, here's one for you. You ready? <laughs> Look at the way his eyes like that. Go on, ask him. Ask oh, him. yeah, sure. Uh, multiply, Frank. Three, six, nine, two, one, eight. Got that? Three, six, nine, two, one, eight. Times four, oh, three. Got it? Times four, oh, three. All right, boy. What's the answer? The answer is 148,794,854. Oh, Mr. Gresham is here, Chief. Oh. Go right in, please, sir. Well, thank you, Miss Miller. Hello, Mr. Gresham. Sit down. Sit down. Now, this is Mr. Harrington. Hi, Mr. Gresham. Mr. Harrington. Oh, do you want me, Chief? Uh, yes, stay, if you will, please, Miss Miller. Right. Uh, you're with the state hospital, Mr. Gresham. That's right. Mm -hmm. I know you're familiar with the institution. Yeah, uh, that's for the chronic insane, isn't it? We have the heavier load of the state's incurables, yes, Mr. Harrington. Mm. I've been in charge of protection out there for the last year. Oh, yes, yes, we know. I know you're busy, so I'll make this brief. When the attendants checked roll this morning, we found one of the patients missing. Uh-oh. Let's uh, go on, Mr. Gresham. Well, naturally, finding him again is part of my job. Mm -hmm. However, I wanted you to have a full report, too. Yes, yes, we'd like to have. Uh, take this down, would you, Miss Miller? Right, Chief. A man or a woman, Mr. Gresham? A man. His name is Kent. Frank Kent. Mm -hmm. I'm not a doctor, Mr. D.A., but I, I do know his history. Yeah, which is what? Well, without using technical terms, Kent is... Uh, well, uh, off in another world is one way to describe him. Mm -hmm. Go on. He's seldom violent. <laughs> in fact, you're seldom aware of him at all. Yes. Well, could he become violent, Mr. Gresham? Mm, my answer would be yes. Uh, most of them could, if the right things happened. Yes. However, you can get more exact dope from the doctors. Mm. You got a description of him? Oh, I know Frank quite well. <laughs> he has a unique ability, actually... Something I've never run up against before. A uh, unique ability, did you say, Mr. Gresham? That's right. He has a head for figures, mathematics. Hmm? He, he's amazing, Mr. Harrington. He can add, subtract, multiply, all in his head. And all in a matter of seconds. No matter how complicated the numbers? Well, I've never seen him stumped yet. Yes, there are cases on record like that. Some of them phenomenal. Yeah, how did he uh, escape, Mr. Gresham? Sometime last night, his door was open from the outside. Uh, maybe some other patient. No, Mr. Harrington, that's literally impossible. There are too many doors to get through. And you have no idea where he might be now? I know Frank's habits, Mr. D.A. I think perhaps I can trace him. Uh, where I need your help, though, yes. we want to know who opened that door. I want to know who opened that door, too. What a place to cut it off. Why oh, did you well, do that? We'll do some more next week, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's... Keep them coming back. <laughs> uh, let's review some of the characters who appeared in that show. Well, of course, uh, Jay Jostin was Mr. District Attorney. Len Doyle was Harrington. Vicki Voller uh, was uh, Miss Miller, I believe it was. Yes. Uh, Cameron uh, Prudhomme played the part of the man interviewed in the office. But of special interest is Frankie, the calculating wizard. That was John Gibson, who will be our guest here in one of the forthcoming shows. So there's a little preview of John Gibson. John so, Gibson, as a matter of fact, was contacted by you in New York, and he was delighted, and he's planning to come up to do the yeah, show. Yeah, very, uh, very happy about that. He was, uh, he's been on, well, he, he started in 1927, so he's had a very long career in radio, and now he's doing TV commercials. Jack, <laughs> we were talking about rehearsals of gangbusters, earlier, and you used the term modicum of rehearsal. Uh, what, what did you mean by that? Well, as uh, compared with television productions that have to be meticulously rehearsed because they're seen, every action is seen, uh, these people stood up and read scripts, so they walked through them a time or two, but they didn't rehearse to the degree that you might have expected them to do, and they were professionals. And they worked week after week after week, and they knew exactly how. It was just a matter of becoming familiar with the role. And that's a quick study for a good pro. I suppose, Ed, that uh, that's why so many of the voices were familiar. Yes, and uh, we, we were talking about this in an earlier program, that uh, all these roles were auditioned. And uh, the reason you hear the same voice is because they were so good that they, uh, they were able to outclass their competition all the time. They were never a gift. Uh, just these men were so good 
that uh, you couldn't unseat them. They could do the job so well. Right. Jack, how many scripts would you, you guess you wrote for Gangbusters? Oh, I would say 40 to 50, perhaps. Uh, unfortunately, I, I have no copies of any of these. They've been lost in through the years moving around. But that's a close estimate, I would say. 40 or 50. One of them involved Dutch Schultz. <laughs> Yeah, name dropping again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you had a lot of friends in those days. <laughs> All right. Well, it, it involved an incident that really preceded Gangbusters a little, but I think it does cast some light on what things were like in those days. Uh, just to give you a quick uh, capsule of it, uh, Dutch Schultz was shot down in a small bar over in Jersey somewhere, but his wife had never been photographed. He made a point of this. And he kept her guarded by two very large torpedoes with very large guns. But we found out, when I was still a crime reporter at this time, that uh, she was going to be interviewed by the Internal Revenue Department to find out where Dutch's money had all gone. And we uh, arranged to break in on this interview, take a quick picture of her, and disappear before they could uh, get at us. And that's what happened. One of the reporters burst the door open and uh, dropped across the door to keep people from coming at us. Uh, the photographer took a picture over him of Mrs. Schultz sitting at the far end of the room, turned and handed me the plate, and I took off down five floors of winding uh, concrete, or marble, I guess it was, and steel steps. They clattered, I remember, uh, with these people behind me a couple of floors back. So I had a lead. And we got to the newspaper office. It was almost a dead heat by then, taxi cabs. And the plate turned out to be blank. <laughs> because the photographer, in his excitement, had forgotten to pull the slide. Fortunate for all of us because the federal marshals were going to arrest us for taking pictures on government property. So it turned out I didn't get shot and we didn't get arrested. But it was quite an exciting day. You also had in your possession at one time one of Dillinger's bank plans, didn't you? Yes, he made meticulous plans in advance of the banks he was going to rob, and I don't know how I acquired that or where it went, but it was very carefully done detailing the, uh, the moments, the number of minutes it would take the bank president, perhaps, who opened the doors uh, to get from his favorite newsstand where he bought a paper every morning uh, to the bank door. It was that meticulously organized. Yeah, he was a craftsman. It was done in a movie, uh, The Asheville Jungle. Uh, they had a movie about the, the same kind of a right. basis. Uh, mm -hmm. with, uh, Jaffe, I guess, uh, did the uh, play that role of planning the job kind of thing. Jack, why did you finally decide to leave the radio business? <laughs> well, it was newspaper reporting was what I was after initially, and this was not uh, what I had set out to do. And the tensions were pretty tough, and the surroundings pretty grim. And it just was not what I could see myself doing for the rest of my life. Well, I'm certainly glad that you shared the years that you were in the business with us tonight. I want to thank you very much. Jack Bishop, manager of agency sales training at the Aetna Life and Casualty, formerly research writer for Gangbusters, We the People, and the creator of Mr. District Attorney. And, of course, our thanks to Ed Corcoran, the man with 2,000 hours of radio memories on tape, who will be back with us next month at this same time or about this same time. Our engineer tonight was Dick Zwerko. Our producer was Brian Hartnett. And this is Dick Bertell. Dr. Christian's office. Yes, there's the clock in Glen Falls Town Hall telling us it's time for Rinso's story of Big Sister, brought to you by the new Soapy Rich. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of mystery, comes his most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy. Special material provided for this program by Don Brush and John Knife. Al Jolson. And now here's the entertainment you've been waiting for. Here's the fellow who let himself go and wound up being Big Bell's biggest colleague, Milton Burrow.